Hi, I'm Meta Spencer. Today we're going to do something really different. We're going to have a talk about huge animals that used to live all over the world, but especially, notably, in the Arctic during the Pleistocene period. Now, I have had very few conversations about that in my life, and I bet you haven't either discussed this a lot. But we've got two people here who know a lot about megafauna and uh, the history of the planet and uh, various animals that used to live here. And it seems that during the Pleistocene period, which is an eon or so ago, that there were huge animals. And of course, we know about the woolly mammoth, but there were other big, big critters that lived in various places in the world and they died out. And I think one of the really interesting things is what happened? Did people kill them when, because people were, you know, began to inhabit the planet and maybe they killed them and maybe it was weather and maybe who knows. So these guys have done some research on these related topics and I want to introduce them and we will have a little conversation about this. They are scholars studying uh, geohistory, I guess you could say, or paleo, paleo uh, biology, maybe. Anyway, uh, Kate Lyons is a biologist at the University of Nebraska, and uh, she studies uh, the effect of climate change on species diversity by looking at fossil records of mammals over the last 40,000 years to see and figure out the diversity patterns in the future. So good morning, Kate Lyons, how are you? I'm fine, thanks, Meta. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure. Okay, now in uh, someplace in Maine, Alessandro Marichetti is uh, a, a scholar studying uh, at the University of Maine, uh, studying or practicing his profession in the School of Biology and Ecology. And he's studying the megafauna uh, that ate plants, and he's looking at Arctic vegetation and also analyzing fossilized feces from Siberia. Good morning. I'm good. Uh, very nice to be here. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, I'll tell you how I came at this. I'm, I'm doing a series of, of talks about things that we can do to potentially uh, offset uh, climate change to varying degrees. Uh, geoengineering, or there can be natural things that, that could be done too. And uh, one of the interesting and, you know, kind of offbeat proposals that I have encountered uh, is uh, an idea that came out of Siberia. There is a father and a son. The father is a very senior uh, a researcher, biologist, I think, paleobiologist, and he, and they've been studying uh, megafauna and the melting of the the uh, permafrost, which of course is a very serious threat because it will, if it melts too quickly, <laughs> it's going to emit enormous amounts of carbon, mostly, I guess, methane, or at least partly methane and certainly CO2 into the atmosphere and exacerbate our problem of global warming. And the senior uh, Zimov, um, Sergei V. Zimov, has been arguing for a number of years that the uh, ex if we head back the woolly mammoths and other huge animals, they trample the soil uh, or the in the snow, they pack it down and they kick it aside to get at the frozen grass and they do things to um, that affect the actual climate. Because if you have a whole herds of these big, big animals, they also knock over trees so that you don't have this, I call it an infestation of, of trees that don't really belong there, but they're growing now more and more in the Arctic. So his solution to global warming, at least to the part that comes from the melting of permafrost, is to repopulate the Arctic with huge animals, and uh, and the bigger the better, and the more, and of course, vegetation eating animals are the ones that you would want, and that these would then keep the, the soil uh, colder. So they have a, a large area that they have fenced off called Pleistocene Park, where they um, 
they have large herds of whatever big animals they can bring in. And they do measure these, the climate and this, or rather the temperature of the soil, and they claim that they, you know, have been able to chill it by just having these big animals in their area. So it's such an interesting and diver a, you know, different approach to uh, solving global warming that I'm fascinated by it, although I've never been able to actually interview the, the Z mouse. I hope to one day. So I'm, I'm, uh, that's where I got interested in the Arctic megafauna. And um, and I don't know how much of what I've just said about the Zimovs and their Pleistocene Park you are already familiar with. Do you both know about this uh, project that uh, exists in Siberia? Yes, I do. Um, I was fortunate enough to uh, meet the elder Zimov a few years ago at a conference where he talked about um, his rewilding with uh, muskox and showing he showed some of the effects of the areas where he had rewilded with muskox and the areas where he hadn't and how the tundra was recovering with the uh, muskox in the system compared to what it looked like without the muskox in the system. It was pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So you've met him and you're, you have, have one up on me because I haven't. Uh, so Alessandra, are you familiar with this research? And tell me about how it, if so, or have, if not, how that uh, relates to what you are interested in doing. Yes, actually, I have been there in 2019 mm. when it was possible to travel and travel to that part of Siberia. Um, mm. It was supposed to be part of the research we were conducting at the University of Maine to assess the linkage between the megafauna component, right? So they had all these animals and uh, permafrost. Uh, my background is specifically in uh, plant ecology. So the interest was to understand what was the effect on the vegetation that was mediating the effect on permafrost. But we all know things went after 2020, so it's, unfortunately we couldn't move forward with the on-the-ground research. But yeah, I had uh, I had the chance to meet both Sergey and um, uh, Nikita, the son, that is becoming more and more involved. And uh, that research is actually, uh, the idea behind it is fundamental for the type of work that we do at the University of Maine that focuses on the interaction between these large herbivores and plants that is, is very interesting, to, to me at least. Mm -hmm. Well, it's good to know. I, I don't know how much people, uh, I don't want to use a pejorative word, but how much people take seriously. You know, it's such an offbeat notion that I imagine it was not um, taken as a practical uh, possibility, if if ever. <laughs> Maybe it's still regarded primarily as something that is a funny idea, but might might be working in another universe, but probably not in this one. Tell me uh, how um, how seriously do people take the idea that it might be feasible and highly desirable and useful to repopulate the Arctic with big animals, the kinds that actually exist now. I know that they're hoping that uh, this Dr. Uh, George Church, I think at, at Harvard is successful in his effort to revive or re restore the existence of the woolly mammoth but uh and so then they would like to repopulate the the arctic with woolly mammoths but anyway tell me about what is considered a realistic um well first of all would this idea is this idea serious is it real is it reasonable uh is there a reason to think that if it could be put into effect that it would work and maybe you agree or disagree. I mean, I'd love to hear you uh, just bat this around a bit and 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 maybe we can infer something from your opinions about this. I'm going to leave it open. Uh, Kate, let, why don't you start off giving your general impression of this whole project or this whole aspiration? Okay. Yeah, so... Um... When when this idea of rewilding was first introduced, it was actually pretty controversial. Um, the first papers were in 
the um, early 2000s, I think. And and um, the researchers that proposed it were, uh, they got a, quite a bit of pushback. And in in the initial papers, their ideas were to actually rewild with um, entire ecosystems. So not just herbivores that had been in the system before, but also bring in carnivores and try and, um, and, and to rewild not just with um, ex, uh, species that were still extant that had formerly been in that ecosystem, but to actually try and rewild back to the Pleistocene and so bring in equivalent species. So, for example, in North America, in some ecosystems, we used to have a cheetah. Um, uh, but a completely different species from the one in Africa. But their arguments were, let's bring in a cheetah um, and um, have basically the African cheetah start preying on North American pronghorn, for example. Um, and they got a lot of pushback for that. But over the years, um, there has been quite a bit of research, um, especially in Europe, rewilding ecosystems in Europe with species that are currently extant and were um, previously in these ecosystems, so the same species, but just extirpated from these ecosystems. So they're now bringing it back um, and doing quite a lot of rigorous research on what, what happens in these ecosystems, how do the plant communities respond, how do other species in the ecosystem respond when you rewild. And what they are finding is that the ecosystems with their rewilded herbivores are uh, much healthier um, and that there's a lot of really interesting um, things that are going on with the plants that I think Alessandro could probably speak to more than I can because I focus on the mammals. Um, but what hasn't happened yet is rewilding with carnivores um, for the most part, other than um, a few isolated examples like reintroducing wolves into Yellowstone in North America. Um, but they're I think that rewilding is a great idea. I think there's a lot of benefits for ecosystems in rewilding with these large mammals. Um, and the research coming out of Europe in particular is showing that it it is making the ecosystems healthier. Mm -hmm. Well, that's encouraging. Uh, so the Europeans are actually doing this. Where Where is this going on? Because I'm not familiar with these. Experiments. In fact, I would say the only two uh, rewilding experiments that I know are ab about at all are the Zimovs in Siberia and another guy named Luke, um, can't think of his surname right now, I'll try to find it later, uh, who has been on my show before and he's starting up, he's been, he's spent a lot of time in, in uh, Siberia with the Zimovs and now he's, he's recently not only made films about it, a super film, but also has um, started up his own uh, rewilding project in in Alaska. I think it's just barely in Alaska. I think it's closer to, uh, you know, the U.S. But at any rate, it's, uh, it's in Alaska. And um, I haven't kept touch with what he's been doing, but the last couple of years, he's started one of his own. So you're saying that there are rewilding experiments going on elsewhere in Europe and that we should be paying attention to. Hmm? Yeah, so um, in the Netherlands, there are some places where they're rewilding. Um, there's a woman named uh, Lisbeth uh, Bakker at one of the universities in the Netherlands who's um, involved in that research. And then there's another guy named Jans Christian Svenning, who's at the University of Aarhus in, in um, Denmark, who's um, been involved in the rewilding efforts in Europe and they're and they're actually rewilding with with multiple different kinds of ecosystem engineers so not just the big mammals but in Scotland there's been an effort to rewild with beavers um, to help bring back uh, ecosystem function around the rivers in Scotland um, so it's it's more than just these big mammals that they're focused on mm -hmm. okay um well, uh, 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 Alessandro, uh, uh, give your impressions about this, and and then I'd like to pursue something, too. Sure. Uh, so, uh, can't add more to what Kate said. It was all very perfect. Uh, about the idea of places in park in particular, uh, it gained a lot of traction in the last 10 years um, because 
they actually started to show results that were showing that the permafrost was affected but whatever was happening at Pleistocene Park. And uh, the original focus wasn't necessarily to bring back the mammoths, like that's become kind of like the media attention gainer of the last few years. Uh, the idea is that these big animals, uh, any big animal actually has a profound effect on its ecosystem because, especially herbivores, because because of their physiology and their behavior, they affect the structure of vegetation around them. You all have an idea of how an ecosystem should be when, uh, you know, we let plants grow, there's some sort of succession from like lower plants to taller plants and there's some internal dynamics inside the, the vegetation patches that leads to a certain that vegetation being the dominant one in absence of disturbance. Um, the, the big idea that is actually what uh, I think inspired a lot of ecologists to kind of look into this thought, sort of research is that disturbance is way more common and it's part of an ecosystem uh, if large animals are around, right? An elephant will trample vegetation, a bison will de- or a horse will debark a tree in the winter to look for food, leading to a mortality of trees uh, that will create spatial heterogeneity in the vegetation. So instead of having one forest, you will have a stand of forest, a patch, a glade, right, kept open maybe by a fire and then the grazing of the herbivores. And that, as Kate was saying, makes the ecosystem healthier, more resilient, uh, because of many factors like increased diversity, increased redundancy of the effect that happens. And about rewilding in Europe, as you might have noticed by my accent, I am from Italy, and uh, I've been I'm very interested in the European uh, rewilding effort. Uh, there are smaller pockets in which these experiments are happening because the scale of Siberia is very different than the scale in Europe, right? And Europe is well, you would probably high wouldn't high be able. I think the Pleistocene Park thing is quite a large. Uh, area, many uh, square uh, kilometers, if I'm not mistaken, it would be kind of expensive to to set something up like that in Italy. Uh, or, oh, yeah. Or, yeah. Um, uh, so the, what are the size of the of the experiments going on in Italy that you mentioned in the Netherlands? They don't have a lot of spare land either. Uh-huh. Yeah, in, in Italy, in it, for example, there is an ongoing effort uh, in the Apennines, close to Rome. Uh, the thing is that compared to the US, for example, how things work in Europe is profoundly different, even on a, the perception of nature. Um, our national parks are completely different than American national parks, because there's just not the space for this vast extent of wilderness. Uh, there's a lot of intertwining between uh, people living in a place and animals being there. So the big mm-hmm. problems of rewilding is the mitigation of the conflict between humans' activities and animals. Uh, we have a lot of wolves, for example, in Italy. We are talking about the thousands. And since animal husbandry is not a big thing in Italy anymore, the conflict there is manageable, and so it's easier to have this kind of like environment. Uh, the scale of what happens in Europe, I've been to a rewilding um experiment in uh, Czech Republic, very close to Prague, the enclosure in which they've introduced uh, European bison and uh, feral horses is pretty much two or three kilometers, like it's one kilometer uh, per one kilometer of fence. Uh, the idea behind this experiment, not necessarily to rewild entire ecosystems, but to test uh, and see, because we are still at that stage, right? What is a high density of herbivores, large herbivores, and a higher diversity of large herbivores doing to the vegetation? So we are trying to understand what happens if these processes that we theorize are actually visible and uh, quantifiable before a stage in which we try to replicate these on a larger scale. But yeah, it's... Well, how's it going? So far, so good. I would say so. Uh, just being there, you can clearly notice, it, as a passerby, you can clearly notice that there is something different between the place with the bison and the place without the bison. You see, really? Uh, yeah, shrubs look different, which is not necessarily very scientific as an assessment, but it's important for animals, right? The, 
the way vegetation is specially distributed create habitat for shelter or for feeding for other species, smaller species. There's an, uh, there's an increase in, uh, for example, wallowing holes where these bison roll to get rid of parasites <laughs> or like, you know, dig to look for mm-hmm. water. Uh, butterfly species, for example, are, uh, there's a lot more in these areas because the way herbivores graze, uh, it's not the same year round. They just go for different species in different moments and this creates a, a more patchy type of growth for uh, flowering plants. And that mm-hmm. creates, for example, uh, more space for this butterfly and more time for this butterfly mm-hmm. to you know, develop and eat the nectar from the flower. So it, it, it's visible and it's pretty astonishing, now, honestly. And now, how long has this been going? And does it, I, I would imagine that it would change over time. In other words, maybe the first couple of years you'd see certain kinds of changes and then 10 years later, the environment would have changed in and some more and so on so that it wouldn't wouldn't reach the a stable condition immediately is that the case or do you quickly find that the whole environment changes in the direct in any sort of permanent way um for what we know and from what i know uh, this is something we're still trying to understand because each uh, biome reacts in a different way, and we don't exactly yet understand what are the main drivers of the change and how much time it takes to kickstart. The people are trying, right? Uh, for example, this place in uh, the Czech Republic, I, I'm, I think that these animals were brought back in 2016, and there is a visible change already. Um, more, more work is needed to understand exactly, you know, what's the formula. Five horses per square kilometer equals to a uh, 10% increase in diversity uh, yeah. of flowers. We don't know yet, but it's usually a time, uh, a matter of a few years, a few seasons. Um, and on the other question, um, the point is exactly to not provide the stability that the ecosystem will encounter in case of um, lack of large herbivores. And this is where it becomes problematic with space, right? Because things change, uh, animal population increase and decrease, and they usually migrate over large scales in case of scarcity of food or seasonal dynamics. We know this from the Serengeti. We, we know this also in the Arctic, like caribou migrate among very vast swaths of territory. Mm-hmm. And we know from the fossil, the, the fossil record that, for example, mammoths are doing that too. So uh, is it enough to bring back a woolly mammoth without giving him a range that is the size of Alaska, we don't know, but uh, probably the variability of the effect is something that um, is affected and will affect how the animals are doing. So it's, mm-hmm. it's very fascinating and difficult. Uh, yeah, uh, Kate, um, I think you, you uh, I'd like to know more about the feasibility of importing, uh, re-establishing herds of big animals in the Arctic. For example, I believe that although they, uh, the Zimovs have brought in various things like bison and muskox and, oh, I don't know what all, uh, they have a dozen varieties of big animals and put them all together, which I gather is a, an interesting experiment itself to see how they get along. But uh, I think that... Um, they go out and feed them in the winter uh, at sometimes uh, that that, they're, they're, that these animals might not make it on their own through the winter uh, and without help. And in that case, then of course the whole idea is um, you know it's very limited. You can't really repopulate the Arctic with animals that you have to feed. Uh, tell me what you think about the practicality of of this kind of um, ambitious goal of repopulating talking about you know millions of big critters is this a, a reasonable thing to do and expect them to live on their own through the through the winters even the globally warm winters that we're having now right and that's a great question um and i don't have a good answer to that directly but i can tell you a couple of stories about some um different things that have happened 
accidentally because of what humans do. And um, one particular study about bison that sort of speak to that, right? So, so part of it is that we're taking these animals and bringing them into what are essentially highly degraded ecosystems, right? And hoping that they will help us restore the ecosystem. And there's a question of how long it's going to take to get that ecosystem to a state in which it's actually healthy enough to support large numbers of these individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there was a study, this really fascinating paper that was published a few years ago in um, the Proceedings of the National Academy in which uh, people were looking at bison herds and their effects on plants in Yellowstone. And what they found was that, so migrating animals like bison, um, there's this this thing that they do where as the plants start to green up over time, they follow this wave of greening and it's it's called surfing the green wave. But it turns out that bison herds, when they get big enough, and this is like over 5,000 individuals, actually stop surfing the green wave and they'll stay in place for much longer um, after the green wave has moved on. And what they found when they've looked at the nutrient content of the plants before and after the bison were sitting in place for a lot longer than they expected is that the because of the way that the bison forage and the way they um, preferentially feed on young plants, they're actually stimulating plant growth and leaf growth on these plants and increasing the nutrient content so that when the bison leave, <clears throat> the Plants that are there are have a higher nutrient content than in areas where the plants or where the bison did not go. And so what that suggests is that perhaps our experiments of rewilding with very small herds in these small areas, because that's what we have, are not actually going to be enough. But that once we get critical masses of these populations of herbivores, it could start having effects on the ecosystem such that they can make it through the winter and don't need um, to be Mm. uh, to get supplemental feed through the winter. And then the the other sort of story I have that kind of speaks to that is um, not in the Arctic, but in Texas. So because of um, the. The. laws around um, private land and what you can do with private land in Texas. And of course, and because of the hunting culture in Texas uh, for decades, um, people with private ranches in Texas have imported large um, herbivores from Africa for game hunting purposes. <clears throat> and oh, so some oh, of the- Sorry, but that's just, I'm, I'm, I'm just boggled. They bring in like elephants to shoot in Texas. Like My that? understanding is that there are some ranches that have elephants, but it's more, there's now free living populations of things like oryx, um, uh, roe deer from, <clears throat> from Europe, um, uh, what is uh, the axis deer, um, just these, these big herbivores for. And for, they bring them just to shoot them. Yeah, they, they bring them in <laughs> for big game hunting, basically, right? And so, Lord. I'm but, they, sorry, but I'm I'm offended, and and I'm I'm not for not for ecological reasons, but just sort of moral reasons. <laughs> that is not a, a good investment of human potential. <laughs> I mean, this is something that I my understanding is they've been doing it uh, for like it started at least a uh, hundred or more years ago. Like this is just you know. When uh, as th- this started, when big game hunting was much more acceptable society wise mm-hmm. than it is now, mm-hmm. um, and of course it's still acceptable in Texas. Uh, hunting is part of the culture in a lot of parts of Texas. Mm-hmm. But um, so for a long time, they would uh, supplementally feed these populations of African um, herbivores that they brought in in order to maintain the populations because they wanted to be able to hunt them during hunting season every year. But a lot of them have um, escaped from the ranches and have naturalized and are now doing just fine. And so there are people at the University of New Mexico, there's a graduate student named Carson Hedberg and part of her dissertation, um, because there's free ranging oryx in New Mexico as well now because of this. And so part of her dissertation- 
sorry, but what the hell is a, an oryx? I, I can't even remember whether it's a bird or a mammal or what. I don't, I don't well, know. An oryx, it's, a, it's a mammal. It's a large antelope. It's the one that has the straight up horns that are spirally. Mm -hmm. um, and it is an arid adapted um, antelope. So it's one that will do well in New Mexico, in the arid lands of New Mexico. You find it in arid areas in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, so, but part of her dissertation is she's going around and collecting poop from the oryx and doing DNA barcoding on it to figure out what plants are in there to try and understand um, how they're interacting with the ecosystem and what they're um, eating, ultimately to try and get a sense of, um, you know, whether they are basically taking the place of some of these herbivores that used to be in New Mexico that aren't there any longer. Um, and are they basically, are they doing something completely new in the ecosystem or are they essentially rewilding, but with a different species? Um, but so we, and, you know, so we do have areas of the U.S. where we have rewilded with different large mammals than were there before that have naturalized and are doing just fine. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, how do you feel about that? I imagine ecologists are... <laughs> I don't know. I shouldn't imagine anything. What uh, it, it, are you learning enough from this to uh, offset any anxiety about destroying a an, an environment that used to be there? I mean, we will learn enough eventually. Um, you know, I mean, the thing is, is that I. I mean, I would argue that there are no pristine landscapes left on the planet. I mean, even oh. Antarctica is um, has humans on it, and um, we have affected Antarctica in many different ways. We find when we study the ocean bottom that it's full of plastic and garbage. And so, you know, there there is no pristine ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And all ecosystems have been affected to one degree or another by humans. And this is just another way that they are being affected. And, you know, as a paleontologist who takes a very long view, immigration and movement of animals naturally um, in response to climate change and in response to um, various different stressors is is normal over long timescales. And so even though this is a immigration event that is, a, you know, more like a once in several million years kind of um, happening rather than, um, you know, a range expansion that you might expect to happen naturally um, in response to, say, deglaciation. Um, it is still something that happens, and it is what it is, and it's not something that we're easily going to be able to fix. And so I think studying it and understanding the effects and using that information to help us um, understand and predict what will happen if we continue to rewild in, in other areas I think is the thing to do, right? I think we just sort of have to accept that this has happened and changing it is difficult to not possible. Okay. Um, so c'est la vie. I mean, you <laughs> you, you have a, a, the long view. Uh, I have a, a, a friend who's a forester who is uh, agitated about the importation of earthworms because it seems that earthworms had been extirpated from Canada by, I guess, glaciers or something. And and now people have brought in earthworms again. Uh, and this bothers her. So uh, I guess everybody has a different point of view about how important it is to try to avoid uh, bringing alien species into a territory. I don't know, Alessandro, how, what do you think about that? Is you're you're interested in the diversity of uh, species. Uh, is this a, a variable value that different scientists have different uh, degrees of uh, opinion about? So, as a I'm a plant ecologist by background, uh, but I'm a paleocologist as a let's say more general profession now, and I do agree with Kate that we tend to have a longer view of natural processes mm -hmm. that I think leads us to the kind of point of view in which change is the norm, not like 
something that happens from time to time. Ecosystems change following invasion of other species. For example, when South America and North America became connected for the first time, there was a huge exchange, mostly from the north to the south, but also from the south to the north. And things like armadillo went to the north and uh, mm. um, opossum and things like pretty much all the carnivores that now are living in South America went to the south and nature adapted and things evolved and became in equilibrium. That's just how things work on longer time scales. We have hum- as humans have had profound impacts on ecosystems since before being homo sapiens, most likely. And that not only means we start fires and we hunt animals, but we move things around. For example, we invent boats. Uh, in Italy now we have, I think, six species of mosquitoes that weren't there 200 years ago. <laughs> and that's something that we cannot control. I mean, we can try to control, but from the point of view of managing the ecosystem in case something goes wrong, it's way easier to eradicate a population of large herbivores, as we unfortunately know, than anything like a mouse or a mosquito. So uh, in the case of rewilding accidental or voluntary of large herbivores, I do not. That's something that my friends ask me all the time. But like, aren't they doing like Jurassic Park? And yeah. we are we are unfortunately very good at extinguishing population of large herbivores. That's part of... Well, that, know, that's a, a question that I, uh, I intended to ask. You know, what happens... <laughs> Uh, I've heard different theories, and maybe by now there's a consensus as to what really happened, what you think you know. But were these, you know, they, I'm I'm only guessing that this happened all at sort of the same time, that in, in various parts of the world, there were other places where there were huge animals, really big ones. And and it's they all died out except I think the woolly mammoths and they died much more recently, but but something happened and I wonder what's the explanation for the death and the uh, you know the extinction of all of those big animals uh, uh, that that existed during the Pleistocene was it hunting was it climate or was it something else? So. If I can go first on that, that's a thousand million dollar question, uh, meaning that I have an opinion that is informed by the type of literature that I read, and many people have a different opinion based on their research. Uh, it's still an open question from my point of view. And actually, I'm not in Maine right now. I'm in Alaska because we are doing some field work, mm. uh, try to see, for example, what was happening to this large animal population in the last interglacial that is when the climate was like today or a little warmer, but we didn't see these widespread extinctions of, for example, Arctic metafauna. And so it's still an open question and it relies on many different levels, right? I'll, I'll make an example. Uh, if some person, for example, let's say uh, there is a war and the, you know, there's a bombing and a uh, house falls after the bombing on a person passing on the street. Has the person been killed by the by a brick or by the war? You know, <laughs> that's the, that's the kind of situation that I think was going on during the uh, during this late quaternary extinction, right? Climate was changing. We were in a moment in which animal populations we know they're vulnerable to climate change. We see it today, and there were like there was this abrupt change around the Angler Dryas. Uh, 12,000 years ago. So that was putting a stress on animal populations. We also know that humans were around on every continent by them, and that we are known to be very good at hunting things that evolved to escape hunting. Being big for an animal is a way to not be predated, except when you're very young. An elephant, after it becomes uh, you know, juvenile, is pretty much unkillable by anything um, except us. So we are able to put a stress on these population that are already stressed uh, by what's going on. So in that larger view, I think that if we weren't around, maybe not all the megafauna that we saw in the Pleistocene and other interglacials before us would still be around, maybe not all of them. But these animals survive, like being a large herbivore is not something that it's a bad strategy for an animal. They existed you know, animals tend to do that. Like we think about the dinosaurs, larger herbivores on the on the land that went on for hundreds of like for millions of years. 
uh, being successful until, you know, the asteroid hit. And then animals evolved again to be very big because that's a very efficient way to use your resources. It allows you to eat a variety of food that are maybe low nutrient, but just by sheer physiological effects, you are able to maintain a better efficiency at being alive. And we see that again and again. We had like elephants all over the world. Now we're left with the one in Africa and Asia. Of course, the, the important question is like, I mean, the very interesting question for me and for uh, some people in my lab is like, why are these animals alive while everyone else is dead, right? Well, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, for me also, sometimes the question arises, not that I s s lose sleep over it, but why, why don't we have elephants in North America or South America? Uh, and you know, I think they have a, they have monkeys all over Asia, but I I don't think we ever had monkeys in North America. I think they do have them in South America. So if we have monkeys in South America, how did they get there? And without populating North America, you know, is there a a, a field of study that tries to explain why there are certain species where they are in relation to what? may have happened to their their death rate in earlier periods. Um, am I asking a sensible question or is that too woolly to to try to swim? No, that's a that's a great question. Um but primates actually evolved in North America. Like they they were in North America way back at the beginning of the Paleocene. Um and uh, went extinct in North America, but not elsewhere. And so the, there's a field of study called biogeography that is focused on where things live and why they live there and what their evolutionary history is. But it's it can get really complicated, even with something like primates that we, you know, we think that they are, um, say, tropical animals or subtropical uh, species and that that's where we find them. But it turns out they have a really complicated um, evolutionary history and were in very different places millions of years ago. So there were, there have been monkeys or apes in lots of places that were not tropical. Well, the world was a lot warmer when we had them in oh. North America. And so in fact, North America was tropical when we had primates in North America. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. But now you it, this bears on the question of whether or not you can take a bunch of North American bison and put them in the Arctic and say good luck, uh, bye bye. Um, that's what the whole premise is to the effort to re rewire the Arctic, that you could just put a bunch of big animals there and and tell them they're on their own. Uh, what what do you think is the outcome going to be from that? Now, given the fact that the trees, for example, are are invading. For example, I, there's a book called, which I was very impressed with at the time, a book called, I think, Tree Line or something like that, by a guy named Ben Rollins, who's a British guy. He, he went all around the Arctic countries, eight or ten countries in the Arctic Circle, looking at what uh, trees exist. Now, they're there shouldn't be a lot of trees up there, and what they have are different from you know they from one country to another. The predominant uh, species of trees, but you know uh, everywhere we're getting an increasing forestation in the Arctic, and that is of course one of the things that the Zimovs are concerned about because trees overall. I, I think it's a big big thing to say and maybe not completely true but that trees have a warming effect overall and some of them maybe a lot more than others but they they warm the soil and you want to keep the permafrost cold and so one of the advantages to bringing in let's say if you could have woolly mammoths or even bison that they knock over saplings and prevent the expansion of uh, new new forests in in the Arctic, so uh, there seems to be reason to worry that uh, trees are growing where they don't belong, and that this will have a an exacerbation effect on the global warming. Is this right? So, so, so yes and no, meaning that uh, trees are just 
shifting the range according to temperature and precipitation, which is what happens when climate increases. So that's something that is normal, given that what we did to the climate leads to increased temperature. And so trees are doing a little better, a little more north, and so they just move. Shrubs are more of a more fast at that. Uh, and also the added carbon to the atmosphere means there's more nutrients for these trees that like need this carbon to grow. Mm -hmm. So it's faster and um, you know the the thing is that these trees and I was in Siberia uh, a few years ago, even now in Alaska, these trees are not fast growing trees. Like it takes maybe a mm -hmm. hundred years to get to one like, you know, three feet because it's not a great environment to be the first mm -hmm. year. It's very easy for uh, grazing or an animals, even just like by scratching their back on a tree to knock it over and like reset this kind of thing. Um, th it's true that they have an effect. It's like this problem is called like shrub encroachment because uh, we give out negative value to the fact that these trees are where we are not used to them. Um, and these, uh, you know, trap snow, creating a deeper insulating layer. So pretty much if the permafrost is exposed to air, which is very cold here, um, it so it freezes deeper, and so it like thaws less in the wind in the summer. Uh, while shrubs tend to be darker, so they reflect, they absorb more light. Their albedo effect is significant compared to, for example, grasses that reflect bounce back light even during the summer. So they increase the temperature of the soil surrounding them, and they trap no right. So they create this kind of white blanket that keeps the soil warmer than it would be otherwise. Mm -hmm. There are mm -hmm. some interesting papers from Greenland by the group led by Eric Post that show that uh, musk coxen, for example, and caribou to a degree, reindeer, uh, just by being there and eating these shrubs can keep uh, this effect at bay. So mm -hmm. it's not so difficult to think that even like by helping population that already are present in the Arctic, like bringing back the muskoxen, which is something that we did to a degree. The, the muskoxen population was like limited to very sparse places in, uh, I think, in the Canadian Arctic. And now it, there's populations in Scandinavia, mm -hmm. in Russia, in, um, in, in Alaska. And they have already this effect of keeping uh, the shrubs from encroaching, right? By eating and preventing them to uh, overcome other types of grass. So uh, about the numbers, well, the, the Pleistocene part, that's what at least Sergei Zimov told me over a conversation, and it, it's true for other places. The whole idea behind it, it comes from observing what uh, local caribou herders are doing. So there's a, a lot of, you know, ancient traditions in many places in the world, uh, and they, that's what we observe to understand how environments work. And in this case, bringing lots of caribou to a place that is maybe as full of shrubs and lichens, uh, after a while, the fact that they're removing biomass and, you know, eating and defecating, that creates kickstart the fact that Kate was talking about. And so you start to see a decrease in these shrubs and these lichens and uh, grassland showing up. And that's the, you know, th this happens already. And this is the kind of idea of alternable sta alternative stable state. So uh, we see some... I'm sorry, but the grassland is something that you would prefer to be there if you really wanted to go back to the kind of environment that existed in and and habitat that existed in in the Pleistocene, right? You want grassland, not shrubs, right? So it's it's a complicated question. Uh, the idea is that the Pleistocene uh, it was called the mammoth step in the literature. This idea of like a kind of a Serengeti of the Ice Age, so mostly grassland, uh, pockets of like you know shrubs and trees, depending on. Uh, how difficult was it for, like, you know, little... The environment in the Arctic really changes a lot based on topography. So, you know, if you're closer to a river, there's going to be something there. If you're on a slope, there's going to be something a little different. But the idea is that it was mostly a prairie, a grassland, more like a meadow. So not necessarily grass, but form, right? So flowering plants mm -hmm. uh, with mm -hmm. high nutritional value. That's actually what we see, for example, I'm working with mammoth coprolites, so for frozen pieces. And we see that through DNA and pollen, like an impressive diversity of species. And they, I'll just mention this briefly because um, I've been speaking for a long time. But we do see in the mammoth species uh, things we weren't expecting to see in the diet of an animal at this latitude. We find a lot of plants, um, ranunculaceae, like buttercups, that we know are toxic to 
cattle today and to horses, but apparently mammoths were able to eat those plants. Mm. Um, so the whole idea that a diverse guild of herbivores, so a diverse array of species can access the resources on the landscape in a more complete way, and so leading to a more profound change in the dynamics of that vegetation. Uh, from what we see in the record, like the, the theme of idea of uh, ecosystem engineers in the Arctic and mammoths being very important, actually makes sense. Now, from that to say, we leave a bunch of bison in tundra and they do the job themselves, that's, that's tricky <laughs> because it's expensive and it's something we need to test. But it's mm -hmm. definitely possible that we might see a change that helps us see. Mm -hmm. Well, and the other thing to keep in mind is that the current ranges of these animals and the current climatic uh, conditions under which we find them are not necessarily the only conditions under which they can survive. Right. There's a difference between there's a concept uh, about the niche concept. Right. And there's a difference between the fundamental niche of a species, meaning all the possible conditions under which it can survive and the realized niche, which is the niche that we actually see expressed in the environment. Mm -hmm. And um, research uh, uh, looking at how species responded to deglaciation and the climate change um, that happened because of deglaciation has shown that um we used to find we had there's there's this idea in the literature called non analog communities, which are sets of either animals or plants that occur together in the Pleistocene that don't occur together today that because they and they are non analog. But what we actually find is that as the climate changed, species shifted their distributions, um, some of them thousands and thousands of kilometers, such that um, we used to the, there are species that are now existing under conditions that they didn't exist under in the Pleistocene and vice versa. And in fact, um, there's a, a professor named uh, Jack Williams, who's at the University of Wisconsin, who has um, looked at plant communities and changes in plant communities over time. And what he's basically shown is that during the Pleistocene, there were combinations of temperature and precipitation that we don't find together in North America, and that that's where we would find these non-analog plant communities. And my own research on mammals and how they shifted their distributions has basically shown that where we find non-analog mammal communities is where we would find these non-analog plant communities. And so just because species have a particular set of climatic conditions under which they exist right now doesn't mean that they wouldn't do well if we did take them and plop them in the middle of the arctic right bison used to be all over alaska mm -hmm. um and so it's not it's not outside of their potential genetic diversity to be able to handle that kind of ecosystem but now how quickly can a a, a climate change phenomenon make a difference. I'm thinking, for example, I believe in this Laura, Laura uh, Rollins book, Tree, uh, Tree Line, that he he went to, I think, among the Sami people in uh, uh, nor, you know Scandinavia, and they are herders of reindeer, but they say they won't be able to keep it up. It's, it's, it's dying very quickly because the reindeer nowadays because of the warming, it'll snow, and then there'll be rain on top of the snow, which freezes and makes ice on top of the snow. The reindeer have to go in there into the snow and kick it aside to get at the grass to eat, and it cuts their legs. So that is just completely antithetical to having a, uh, you know, making your living with herds of, of reindeer. Uh, that would mean, it, I would imagine that a change that so quickly brings about increasing ice on on snow uh, would, you know, el eliminate a whole whole bunch of species right away. Because if the if the reindeer die out, then there are other things that are going to be affected by their absence, right? Yeah. Oh, so, yes. oh, go ahead, Alessandra. Oh, yeah, that, uh, that's why climate change is dangerous for animals. And that's why mm -hmm. we think it clearly played a role in the final, ex I mean, at least I think it clearly played a role in the final extinction of these large herbivores. Um, it acts quickly and it acts by increasing the uh, unpredictability of weather events, right? We see it every day. Like even in Maine, we had such a weird winter, this, this winter, we barely call it a winter, but we got 
snowstorms and then rain. And my friends tell me that it wasn't supposed to rain in the winter in Maine until like 10 years ago, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, while animal population dynamics try to catch up to the climate, right? They are determined, like somehow a bad season means higher mortality, a good season, higher birth. But then it takes time for this birth to propagate into higher population. Uh, and there's some science out there that thinks about the feasibility of like large scale evolving efforts. Like some paper came out, I think in 2021, uh, actually putting the numbers behind it, like how much money is needed, how much time is needed, because how long does it take for a bison to, you know, from for one bison to become five bison, right? For one well, that's mammal, what I'm, I, I would like to ask that in particular. If you agree that it would be a good idea to try to repopulate the entire Arctic with with huge animals, and that somebody wants to put the money into doing that because it's a big job, how long would it take? And even, I mean, there are two questions: Would is what are the odds that a significant number would survive and 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 actually be able to create new herds? And how long would it take to create a whole new herd? And and how many many years or how many generations would it take to really repopulate the Arctic, um, even if the under the best and uh, most optimistic circumstances? That's a big order, I know, to ask for within two or three minutes of our ending the conversation. But that's really kind of what I want to know. Um, that's a great question, and I don't think we quite know the answer, right? Like one difference between climate change now and climate change in the Pleistocene where species were able to keep up with the climate change is that it's happening much, much faster now. And we have also uh, built up all kinds of barriers to dispersal that didn't exist in the Pleistocene, right? We didn't have roads and farms and cities. And, and so uh, species were able to respond to climate change during the Pleistocene uh, much more easily than they are now. And I actually disagree with Alessandro just a little bit in terms of uh, what caused the end Pleistocene extinction. I think it's humans. Um, there are areas of the globe where the extinction happened when we weren't having significant climate change because it happened at different times on different continents, but it always happened after humans showed up. And so I think it happened more rapidly in North and South America because of the stress that climate change was putting on populations there. But it's not it's not climate. It, hap it happened in places without big climate change um oh, and um, so sorry but i also think it's humans i probably I, I also think it's humans i probably misexpress myself <laughs> <laughs> no no you, you said ultimately humans i think we just disagree a little okay, bit yeah. about how much of a role climate played i think in northern south america it did play a role but i think on other continents it didn't um and it's not a requirement but what is a requirement if you're going to drive large numbers of large mammals extinct is humans, right? And and if you think about it, there are two reasons why that happens. One is in order to drive a species extinct, all you have to do is suppress their uh, reproduction so that they're not replacing themselves, right? If you're removing enough of the females or enough of the babies from the population and the population uh, starts decreasing, eventually it will go extinct. And the other reason is humans are not tied to their prey the way um, other carnivores are. Um, our population sizes, when so when we would decimate a particular population of our preferred prey and that population would go down, our population sizes would continue to go up because we just switched to another prey, right? And so we'd continue to take our preferred prey when we encountered it, but we our population sizes didn't crash. And so we would just continue to in increase our population sizes as we decimated um, species after species. Hmm. Um, okay, but then to get back to your question about how long would it take to repopulate the Arctic, it's hard to say because so much of the planet is um, controlled and managed by us. There, there aren't really populations that out there that aren't being impacted by humans in some way. And so understanding how quickly these a large mammal population can respond is difficult to say because most of them are contained within um, some area that we let them live in. And the size of that area affects how big their populations can get. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how long it would take to, to rewild the Arctic. Would you be in favor of trying? Assuming 
you know, there's going to be a lot of demand for money to to meet many of the emerging challenges that come with global warming, uh, especially, you know, the effort to to bring in geoengineering events, uh, activities at scale. That's costly. But uh, and I'm in favor of those mostly. But would it be worth while to do what we can to actually rewild the Arctic? I think yes. Um, I mean, I don't think like if your reason for doing it is to solve climate change, then that doesn't really make sense. But if your reason for doing it is to try and maintain and preserve these ecosystems, then yes, we should do it. All right. Alessandro, yeah. what do you think? I completely agree. Uh, it's one of the few self-sustaining kind of position to address the effect of climate change in the Arctic, if it works. I, you know, the science back the fact that it has a very healthy effect on these places from a perspective of like the humans living there. Um, a lot of what goes, goes on uh, up in the north, it has to relate with animals, right? Hunting, fishing, uh, you know, people are very affected by climate change up here. And from my perspective, of course, having access to a more diverse array, even of prey, once when these populations are natural and success, right? Uh, if caribou for one year have a bad year because of the rain or snow, well, maybe you hunt bison that are a little sturdier, maybe have a different way to do it. Mm -hmm. And I, like, just from a personal perspective, I'd rather live in a place where there's herds of bison and muskox and caribou roaming in the Arctic than a place in which they don't exist, which is what we have now. So, yes. Totally. Well, it's nice to see both of you agreeing. And I, I personally am ready to agree with you anyway. I, I was hoping that you would take that position. So we're all together. And let's go see if we can rewild the Arctic, uh, among our other uh, interesting challenges that no doubt we're going to be meeting over the next gener 10 years or so. Thank you both. This has been great fun. And I feel much smarter now having heard all the wisdom that you have to share with me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mela. Bye. Bye. Project Save the World produces these forums. This is uh, episode 597. Watch them or listen to them as audio podcasts on our website, to savetheworld.ca. People share information there about six global issues, and we welcome your comments, too. To find a particular talk show, check the scroll list on the homepage or use the search bar. Project Save the World also produces a quarterly online publication, Beast Magazine, which now serves as a free of charge newsletter to help mobilize knowledge about six global threats to humankind. We gladly email the magazine as a PDF or a link to any interested organization in the world that works to prevent a global catastrophe involving war and weapons, global warming, famine, pandemics, radioactive contamination, or cyber risks. Just email us at office at peacemagazine.org and we'll add your group's email address without charge to our list. Please type subscribe my group as the subject of your email. For individual subscriptions at $20 Canadian per year, go to pressreader.com on your browser and search for Peace Magazine.